How many of you truly believe that our God reigns forevermore? Amen. The Bible says that where two or more are gathered, that he is in our midst. How many of you believe he is in our midst today? We invite you to continue in worship with us. Fullness of eternal promise. Stirring in your sons and daughters. Earth revealing heaven's wonders. Spirit come, Spirit come. What you spoke is now unfolding. And all your children shall be holding. Dreams awaken at this moment. Spirit come, Spirit come. So pour your spirit out. Pour it out. Let your love run over. Here and now. Let your glory Your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. Now the world awaits your presence. This power is within. King is soon returning. He's soon returning. Yes. As we hold to this assurance, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come, Spirit come. Pour it out. Let your love run. Let 
17 tells us that if we have faith in Jesus as small as a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds, if we have that much faith, we can say to the mountains in our lives to move and they will move. Amen? Amen. Well, how many of you have a mountain in your life that you need moved? We're here to encourage you today. Have faith in Jesus. Just a little bit of faith as a mustard seed. Say to that mountain, move, and it'll move. I invite you to continue to worship with us. Walking around these walls and I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet His promises are true the promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence, you never fail me yet. Never failed me yet. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus is still enough for all of our needs. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness 
you just say to that mountain, move, and it will move out of your way if you have faith in Christ. He's done it before, and he'll do it again for us. Amen. I see you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way, and I believe I see you do it again. I see you If you believe God is moving mountains right now, come on. If you really believe God is moving in your life and in your situation, 
Would you by faith give him a 30 second praise in this building right now? Come on, lift up your voice. Come on, lift it up. I see you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. Come on, you're getting there. Come on, you're getting there. Come on, you're getting there. Come on and shout one more time like you believe it today. Someone might say, you know, it really don't take all of that. Well, it depends on what you want. I mean, it really does. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that to Paul and Silas when they were in the prison cell and they were singing and praising and worshiping God and their praise caused a prison break. So I, would, I, I wouldn't say that to the blind man who was begging for sight when they told him to be quiet and he cried out that much more because Jesus was passing by. It just depends on what you want. I, I don't know if I would say that to the children of Israel as they marched around their promise. And on the seventh day they marched and finally someone said, let's let out a shout so that these walls will come down. You need anything to come down in your life? You need some things to come down so that you can go through in your life right now? Well, let's shout one more time to the Lord. You need to break out of something. Let's shout one more time. You need God to do something right now. Give him a shout one more time. I see you move. You move the mountains. And I believe. I see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe. I see you do it again. some of you believe what you're talking about this morning. So before you're seated, 
I want you to tell at least three people that thing is moving. Would you do it right now? Whatever it might be, that mountain is moving. Could you do that? Amen. How many believe that God can, God has, and God will do mighty things? I believe he's doing it in all, all of what we're believing God for and trusting God for. He's moving in a mighty, mighty way. I want you to um, mark your calendars for February 24th as Envision Sunday. And we're going to be sharing some really good news with you about 2018, celebrating the journey, where God has brought us from, what God did back in 2018, but we've turned the page, and we're in 2019, and uh, we're just believing that our best is yet to come, amen, that our best is yet to come, it is, and hopefully we'll be able to share some things with you, um, even some buildings, building update. We haven't forgot about that either. We're still working on a few things that we're believing God for. So how many believe he's able? Hey, I don't know. How many, how many of you believe he will? I believe that with all of my heart. And so we're trusting God. There's some, can't, can't give it all to you today. So I'm just letting you know, be here on the 24th. Uh, in both services, we'll share some of these things with you. And just uh, where we're at, where we're going. Praise God. Our ushers are coming at this time, and let's get ready to receive this morning's tithe and offering as we continue to worship God in our giving. God is so good, so faithful, right? Never have the righteous been forsaken. We, we don't have to beg for anything, so if you're begging, quit. You're a king's kid. King's children do not beg. They ask. They ask the Father, and He provides, and we thank Him for it. So, Father, we just, Lord, You know the needs that are represented here today. Not only do You know those needs, but You've already met those needs. Lord, everything that we need spiritually, materially, financially, have already been met. Jesus paid the price, purchased it all on Calvary. So we thank you, God, in advance for what you're doing, what you've done, and what you're going to do. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Go ahead, ushers. Good morning, Life Point Church. Good morning. Good morning. How was the 1115 service? We doing going all right? Doing good. Yes. All right. They had their coffee today. <laughs> Welcome to Life Point Church. It's great to see everybody this morning. Always an honor to uh, worship alongside of each and every one of you. If this is your first time, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you visiting with us, and we hope you do find a home here at LifePoint. If you hadn't had the opportunity to check in with LifePoint Central on your way in, please do so before you leave. They just want to get you a little more information about our church, and they also want to give you a gift as well. So make sure you check in with them. What do we have going on? Oh, we have always exciting things at LifePoint. Some of you ask, you know, what's my next step? I've been at LifePoint for maybe a couple weeks, maybe a couple months. What do I do next? Well, I'm going to tell you what you can do next. The first Sunday of every month, we offer a class called Growth Track. It's just a little insight into Life Point. We do um, a spiritual a, a spiritual giftings assessment, a personality assessment. I don't want to say test. It's an assessment that you find out a little bit about yourself. You can find out about areas to serve, about our life groups. So if that's something that you think you would like, I guarantee you, you would like it. So just take my word for it and join the class. March the 3rd, 9.30 during the first service. And then you can stay and come and hang out with us in the second service. Oh, I better tell them how to sign up, right? How do they do that? They can do that at LifePoint Central or at lpcmentor.com. No, no, I think Josh is a little better at that. At Stop you, at it. Yeah. Okay, well, since we're talking about Josh and Tara... Come on up, guys. They're going to tell us what's going on under the little red tent out front. These guys always have such good stuff to tell us. I love when you guys come up because you do fun things, good things that are fun. I want to steal the mic real quick. Uh, can we, can we, um, people online, hey guys, how are you? 
Put your hands together for that worship again, man. That was lit, fam. I love you guys. Thank you so much. That's just awesome. I absolutely love it. Here's Tara. She has a script. <laughs> I'm really working on not having a script, but it's I still need it. Okay, so we're uh, talking about our new outreach. It's called Loads of Love. It's going on for this week and next week, and um, it's a two-parter. Uh, the first part is we are collecting laundry pods, like Tide Pods, or uh, it doesn't have to be that brand, but... Those pods we're going to then uh, pass along to a life group. It's uh, for homeless outreach and they go to a woman's shelter once a month and uh, we're gonna help them with their mission um, through the laundry that way. Um, you can sign up or check out the life groups at opcmentor.com. Yes. <laughs> uh, and the second part of this outreach is um, we are accepting donations. Uh, we're going to then apply those do donations. We're going to make a team and go to local laundromats to help spread the love locally. And uh, we're under the red tent. You can sign up uh, if you want to be part of the team or we can accept donations there. We have these lovely little envelopes. Um, or you can also give at lpcminor.com slash give slash oh no not no more slashes slash give loads of love <laughs> and uh so <laughs> he did he did a good job um <laughs> uh also taste and see we're still collecting uh next week will be our collection we're asking for uh bottled water loaves of bread or fruit um, so thank you for your time. Okay. And Life Point's such a giving church, and I just want to thank you guys for that. So have a good service. Here. Thank you, guys. Let me just say, I'm mean, going to know this is extra, but, you know, this couple is a great couple, but when they get these projects they bring us, it's from their heart, because this girl is, like, exploding with excitement over this. She messages me a lot during the week, which is awesome, but she, she really does pour her heart into this and this is something God puts into her so I'm I'm proud of you guys this is a good good thing for life point to have you guys working with us sorry I said say that okay oh and you can get a piece of candy if you sign up okay Adam sorry no it's okay thank you guys uh life group leaders this one's for you uh February 24th which is two Sundays from now uh, we're going to have a little training on uh, on planning center. So planning center is our internal system that helps us do a lot of things. Uh, but for life group leaders, that is essentially going to be your communication with your groups. A little bit overwhelming sometimes. There's a lot in there. So we want to arm you with all the information that you need to take advantage of that system to the fullest extent. So again, February 24th at 10 a.m. Uh, right over here. So if you're a life group leader, check it out talking about life groups we've got some more to introduce you this morning we have one more week of signups but these three lovely ladies are coming to the stage welcome them this morning there's norma nicole and sarah these are some new life groups and they just want to give you a little bit of information of some stuff that they have to offer come on over here in the middle ladies so those on live stream can see you all right miss norma what's going on with bible basics Bible basics is for the person that's new to the Christian walk or the person and or the persons that have come out of a church that did not encourage you to read your Bible. The Bible is very basic. It's an Old Testament and a New Testament. Why? Okay, and it's, it's kind of like if you uh, live in a neighborhood, most of your life you grew up there, that your neighbors know you very well from a child to uh, whatever age you are now, and you go over there to your neighbor across the street or next door and you say, I have this problem. And you relate your problem and the neighbor thinks, I've got a solution for that. And then you say, well, I have this other problem and I have this other problem. And then you say, goodbye. Well, if you read your Bible, you can find out God wants to direct you. He wants to guide you as your, as your father. He also wants to love you as your daddy. He wants to give you compassion. He wants to pour out his love. He wants to be everything that you need, but you've got to know his word. And I mentioned to the first service, if you're from the Western world and you want to read the Bible, please do not start in Genesis. If you're an Asian and you want to read the Bible, please do not start in Revelations. There are better places to learn. And if you've never, if you've never been exposed to the Bible itself, you don't know where to start or what to learn. So 
Bring a Bible if you have one. If you don't, there'll be uh, uh, some available. Uh, probably by the end of six weeks, you'll want to buy a Bible. Thank you, Norma. It's going to be an awesome group. Okay, Miss Nicole, tell us about Breathe. So first I want to say, how many of you guys here are so thankful and grateful for Pastor and Jamie and everybody that serves here at Life Point Church? Give it up for them. Thank you, guys. I wouldn't be here serving and being part of a Life Point group if it wasn't for all the work and efforts that everybody here puts in so that this we can do this. Um, so by show of hands, how many of you guys are stressed out during the week, a little overwhelmed, maybe tired or exhausted at the end of your week? Just go ahead and show me your hands. Come on, I know there's more hands out there. All right, wouldn't it be great to just have a few minutes to stop and breathe? 10 minutes to just relax, sit down, meditate, think about God's word. And that's what Breathe wants to bring to our Life Point groups. And so we're going to spend some time with a blanket and a pillow. So come up and check me out at signups. You'll learn more about that. Sorry, guys, this is for ladies only. So next time, maybe, maybe it'll be more. But give, I'm going to give it up to Sarah. Come check me out up at signups and we'll hope to see you guys there. Thank you, Nicole. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sarah Bidlack. I've been going here about two years. Um, hi. <laughs> so I am one of the uh, leaders of the Parent Date Night. So um, why did we want to start this? Uh, kind of to go piggyback off what Nicole said. I'm sure some of you that raised your hands have children that are exhausted <laughs> and tired. Um, so, you know, we wanted to just show the love and serve you guys. Um, so we're offering free babysitting at the MAC, fourth Friday of the month, 6.30 to 8.30. And you can, you know, plan a date night with your significant other. I've had, you know, women just come, drop off their kids, go shopping. Um, I had a couple go home and clean their house. Um, so, you know, anything that you want to plan for those two hours, you know, we'll take your kids for free at the MAC. Um, my husband and I, my husband Ryan and I are going to be doing February 22nd, the first babysitting night. Um, you can sign up. There's registration on lpcmentor.com slash life groups, right? Um, and if you have any other questions, I'll be out at the front after service. Okay, Sarah. Thank you, ladies. Look, these are just three groups of many that we have this, uh, this semester. The 17th is the beginning of our winter spring 2019 life group semester. We're excited about it. There's a lot out there. Again, this is just a taste of what there is. So step out up front, get a little more information. We do have more information about the light groups on our website. One more time to redeem yourself. Let's go. lpcmentor.com slash right. groups. Oh, that was bad. Get connected, everybody. <laughs> yeah. We love you. Let's have a good service. All right. We want you connected. We want you in a part of a life group and serving. And we just believe that you grow. That's how discipleship happens, that you grow through serving. So we want you to be a part of that. Amen. Um, I should have a pulpit out here or something. I'm thinking, I think that might be important. Let's give it up for Frank. Amen. Look at that. <laughs> Right there, you're, thank you. Come on, let's let Frank know we appreciate him. Did you say pizza? The, um, yesterday was National Pizza Day, I heard. Was it? Every day's National Pizza Day. I mean, right? So, um, in case you don't know me, I love pizza. It loves me. We have a love-hate relationship. And we're working it out. But anyhow, it's good to see each and every one of you. And uh, like I said, let's do life together. There's three simple steps here at Life Point Church. It's God, it's groups and gifts. And we want you to get connected with somebody, get connected with a group. We believe you can grow and develop in your relationship. That's how we uh, disciple those here is just connecting. And so there are 30 some groups, I think, this this uh, semester. And Jamie and her team have done a wonderful job. Let's let them know how much we appreciate them so much. And um, so online, stop out front. You can, you can 
can get connected that way. Beginning a new series entitled Forgiven. How many are thankful that you've been forgiven? Anybody thankful besides me that you've been forgiven? I know I am. And, um, you know, forgiven, and then part of that is dealing with love and loving through and loving beyond the hurt. Here we go again. It's been one of those days. Loving through and loving beyond the hurt. Because if you're going to open yourself up, if you're going to open your heart up, then your heart's going to get broken. Can anybody attest to that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? But that doesn't mean that we stop loving, and that doesn't mean that we stop forgiving. Think about it. Think about if God would treat us that way. Think about if God chose not to forgive us. Where would we be without the forgiveness of God? And so we're going to talk about that over the next couple of weeks. We're going to get into this series and we're going to find out just exactly what it means to be forgiven. Come on, Dave, what it means to be forgiven and to love beyond the hurt. Let's let Dave know we appreciate him. We've been playing tag all day. When we get our own place, these sound devils are not following us there. I'm not talking about the sound people. I'm talking about the interference that come. <laughs> just need to make that clear. Let me go home. Man, he called our sound man a devil. Well, they've been called worse. I can guarantee you that. But <laughs> not by me, by the way. I, I'm digging a hole. I need to get out. Can you guys forgive me? Sound guys, forgive me? Okay. Uh, let's let's uh, pray because I need it really desperately now. So let's pray and then let's, let's see what God has to say. Father, I think need to give. Yes, God, that you bless, Lord, uh, us this afternoon, God, that you give us ears to hear, Lord, what you're saying. Pray, Lord, that you would just uh, open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirit to receive from you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And everyone said, Amen. Second Corinthians chapter number five, beginning in verse number 17 through verse 20 says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ. The new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. So saved people are not just forgiven people. Saved people are changed into a new creation. Now, that doesn't mean that we're perfect by any means, but it means that we are changed and we are being changed. I personally, and I want to tread lightly here, but I personally would question someone's conversion if there's never been a change in that person's life. Because it's more than just making a decision. It's understanding that we have been changed, not through anything that we can do, but through the power of Jesus Christ. And so it goes on to say, and all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry, notice that, of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting People sins against them. And it's not because God was soft on sin, but it simply is letting us know that God was not holding that against us because he transferred that sin to Jesus. So Jesus bore that sin, our sin, on the cross. And, goes on to say, has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So the ministry of reconciliation, the message of reconciliation. We therefore, Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. In other words, God is speaking through us. God is using us as the messenger to let other people know about his amazing grace. He goes on to say, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 
The term reconciled to God is not the result of anything that you and I could do, but rather it is the result of the work of Christ on the cross. Because there's nothing, and we know this, there's nothing that we can do to earn or deserve God's forgiveness, God's love, and God's grace. The Bible says this, Jesus, if you would read on, verse 21, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he's the one who bore our sin. He's the one who makes us righteous or in right standing before God. He's the one who reconciled us back to the Father. Aren't you thankful for Jesus this morning? Well, come on, put your hands together and give him praise. And so one of the meanings of the word reconciled means to the, it means to receive one into favor. It means one who receives favor. And so reconciliation is a gift that a person receives, not based upon merit, but rather based upon the favor of God. Say it another way. It is the act of God's grace being extended in our lives. And grace is simply this, church. Grace is we receive what we don't deserve. Because we don't deserve forgiveness. But his, he's favored us and he has forgiven us. We don't receive, we don't deserve his mercy, but yet he's favored us and we receive those things. We don't deserve his love, but yet he has favored us and we receive those things, not because of anything that we have done. That's religion. Religion tells us that if you do X, Y, and Z, then you receive from God. But Christianity says it's already done through the work of Calvary, and all you need to do is receive. Amen? Receive. And so it is an act of grace. To be reconciled to God is an act of the grace of God in our lives. And so Paul tells us that as believers, that we have been called to this ministry of reconciliation, and we are committed, it's been committed to us, the message of reconciliation. The word committed here simply means to set forth, or it means to serve. So it would be like going to a restaurant this afternoon, and your waiter or waitress uh, takes your order and comes back, and usually they have a platter or whatever, a plate that they serve your food to you on, right? And so that's the picture that Paul's painting for us here. He says, you've been committed to serve or to set forth this message. It's spiritual food. You've been committed to set forth this message before the world. If anybody's going to hear the gospel, they're going to hear it because you and I go forth with the message of reconciliation. Amen. Listen to me. It's not just for the preacher. It's not just for fivefold ministry giftings. The message of reconciliation has been committed to the body of Christ. So wherever you're at, God has equipped you and empowered you to be his messenger and to share this message of hope that he's given us. Meaning this, as a believer, it is our responsibility to offer or to serve the same thing that was offered and served to us, and that is the gift of forgiveness. Aren't you thankful for God's forgiveness this morning? Come on, aren't you thankful for his forgiveness? It is the gift of forgiveness, not based upon merit, but based upon the word of God. So in order for Jesus to reconcile us back to the Father, he had to suffer tremendously. When you think about his life, he was betrayed. They lied about him. He was forsaken. He was abused. He was abandoned. And ultimately, the Bible said that he was willing to lay down his life. And one of the last things that Jesus said while he was laying down his life was this, Father, 
Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I want you to think about everything that Jesus experienced up until that point upon the cross. All the things that I just talked about, the betrayal, the lying, the beating, the abuse, all of those things. And yet he gets to a place and into a moment where he looks down and he says, Father, I ask that you continue to forgive them. What is he doing? He's offering the message and the, 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 the message and the miracle of reconciliation. Now, it's hard for us, if not impossible, for us to understand how Jesus could utter such words and really mean them. And the reason that I believe and the reason that I know that he could do that is because Jesus was operating and living on a level of love that very, that very few seldom get to. Now, all of us at some point in some time have probably been betrayed, have probably, there's been a trust issue that has been broken. Someone has lied about us. We've been abandoned or we've been abused in some form or fashion. And so it's hard for us to imagine to be able to utter those words, Father, forgive them. But as I said, Jesus was on this level or he was at a place that we seldom get to because as believers, we are encouraged, back it up, we are called of God to live life differently on this earth. We're not supposed to live like the world. We're in it, but we're not of it, right? Our ways are different than the ways of this world because we are in God's kingdom. For instance, one of the ways in the kingdom of God is that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must do what? You have to humble yourself and become a servant to all. The Bible also lets us know that if you want to get in the kingdom, you must be willing to give in the kingdom. Totally opposite from the world. The, the Bible also teaches us this, that the world loves those who love them. But Jesus said, you need to love those who hate you. How many of you know that's a little bit tougher? How many of you know that's harder to love somebody who despises you, who hates you, but yet we are encouraged and we are told that we should love those who hate us? Because the world typically sets conditions on their love. In other words, they've set terms on their love. And when we meet those expectations, or we live up to their terms, or if they feel like it, then they will offer their love. But that's not how we're supposed to love. We are supposed to love unconditionally. And the Bible lets us know that love is a powerful weapon that God has given us. And I doubt too many times that we look at love as a weapon, but it really is a weapon in the hands of God. When we look at the weapons that God has given us, we know that he's given us the name of Jesus. We know that he's given us the blood of Jesus. We know that we have the armor of God. We know that God has assigned angels over us and they guard us and they protect us and they war on our behalf. We know that the word of God is a weapon in our hands. We know that worship can be a weapon, that God uses worship as a weapon. But how many of us really view love as a weapon? But I believe that God God is telling us today that love, God's love, is the greatest weapon that he has given his church. How many of you know we can bring a lot of things down and bring, a he bring healing to a lot of things with the love of God? We know that love is kind. We hear these things at weddings, but we know that love is kind. We, lo we know that love thinks no evil. We know that love is permanent. We know that love endures all things. We know that love does not give up. But can I just tell you this morning that you and I cannot walk in love until you learn to walk in forgiveness. Woo. Well, I had you up until that point right there. We can't walk in love, the God kind of love, until we learn to walk in the God kind of forgiveness. And we may not see eye to eye on everything, and we may not agree on everything, but here's what I know, that if we can focus on the blood of Jesus and we can forgive others like Jesus has forgiven us, 
that we can find common ground and we can live in some form of unity. Amen? If we learn to love like God loves, we can learn to live among each other. I believe that to be true this morning. Amen? I want you to look at this. I want, to, I want you to look at an example of reconciliation. It's found in John's Gospel, chapter 21, and verse 15 through 17. I want us to look at it here. This is what it says. It says, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than all of these? Simon said, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said to Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, how many times did Peter deny Jesus? The third time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, you love me. And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him his, this the third time. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is what I believe. I believe that Jesus is reconciling Peter back to himself but I also believe that he is teaching him a lesson on how reconciliation works. Because in our English language, we have one word for the word love. But in the Greek in which your New Testament is written in, there are three different words for the word love. The first word is eros, which is sexual. It's where we get the word, the word erotic. And so that's the first word. The second word is phileo, and that word means to approve of, and it means treat affectionately or kind. Um, how many have ever heard the term Philadelphia, brotherly love? It's where it came from. So this, this phileo, Philadelphia, it's a brotherly love. It's to love like that. And then the third word is the word agape. Probably you've heard of that word, which means divine. It means unconditional. It's, it's the God kind of love. And so this is what Jesus is doing in this conversation with Peter. He's saying, Peter, do you agape me? Peter, do you love me unconditionally? He was asking Peter, do you love me with the highest level of love? And Peter's reply was, Lord, I love you. In other words, phileo, with a brotherly love. I'm, act, uh, and I'm, I'm here to show you kindness. I approve of you. In other words, he was not on the same level as Jesus when it comes to loving. Jesus asked him again, do you agape me? And again, Peter responded with phileo, brotherly love. And so the third time is the interesting one because when Jesus said, do you love me? Jesus then lowered from agape to phileo. In other words, Jesus said, offered you the highest form and the highest level of love. But when he realized that Peter could not match it, he brought it down a notch, which makes me wonder and it makes me think, how many things would God do for us if we moved up a level in our love? What could God do through us and what could God do in us if we moved our level of love, first of all, for him and secondly, for others. In other words, if we had more than, watch out, just a casual relationship with Jesus. Because this is what Peter's saying to Jesus at this time. This time, He said, I love you like a brother. I just love to hang out with you. I love you to be around. I love to be around you. But Jesus is saying, that's fine. That's great, Peter. But if you want to be used the way that I want to use you, then we're going to have to change our relationship. We're going to have to change the way that you see me and change 
change how you feel about me. In other words, Peter, we need to move this brotherly love to agape love because if I can get you to love me on this level, there's not anything I can't do for you and there's not anything I won't do through you. It changed Peter to the point where at the end he was willing to give his life for Jesus. It's not just a brotherly thing now. I love him to the point where I'm willing to lay down my life. And he was crucified. And because he loved the Lord so much, he said, I don't even want to be considered in the same way. And they crucified him upside down. This is how he ended his life. That's the kind of love that God wants to pour in our hearts and wants us to live in and live by. I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to think about it. I want you to write it down or, or put it to memory. Could it be that God is calling us to a higher level of love? Could it be in this day and age where there's so much division, politically, socially, economically, where there's so many times where we have to choose which side we're going to be on? Could it be that God is calling us to a higher level of love, to move out of this phileo love and to move into this agape love where we love people unconditionally? Because here's what I believe. I believe that love is the answer to a broken home. I believe that love is the answer to the addict. I believe that love is the answer to fractured relationships. I believe that love is the answer to those who are offended. And I believe that love is the answer to those who are heartbroken right now. Love is the answer. Love can shatter division. Love can rebuild what has been broken. Love is the true answer. It is a weapon that God has given us. In this message, I looked up the word nitroglycerin. I'm going to tell you why. If you look up the word nitroglycerin, you'll find out that it's used for two diametrically, I mean, you couldn't be further apart for the use of it. One of the uses of nitroglycerin is it's put in dynamite to blow things up. Bridges, buildings, whatever. It's also put in pills for those who have heart issues that can bring about healing, especially if you're having a heart attack. And I asked Jamie this first service, where mine are? I have some somewhere. I just don't know where they're at. I don't need them in Jesus' name. Okay. Anyhow. So I thought about that. Here's this thing that can either blow something up or heal something. How you choose to use it determines the outcome. Here's this gift that God has given us called forgiveness. Here's this amazing ministry that God has bestowed upon us called reconciliation. And God is letting us know as his people, it's up to us what we choose to do with it. We can use, we can use it to blow things up or we can use it to bring healing in people's lives. I think God would want us to use it to bring healing in people's lives, right? I think we all agree on that. The choice is up to us, though. The choice is up to us on how we choose to love one another and to treat one another. How we respond to these things, how we react to these things, lets us know we, where we stand on our love level. Anybody know what I'm talking about right now? Say with me, it's going to get worse. Okay, here's the second question. What is happening in your life right now that's testing the way that you love? There's something going on. If not, it will be. But there's something going on in your life right now that's testing the way that you love. Maybe you want to reconnect with a son or daughter that you haven't spoken to in months. Or maybe, maybe your son has informed you 
that his girlfriend is pregnant, and now what are you going to do? Or maybe, maybe a loved one is suffering from an addiction that is overwhelming not just in his life, but every single person in the family. Or maybe, just maybe, that you have an adult son or daughter who has informed you that they're gay and they're done with God and they're done with church. Let me tell you something. I just didn't randomly pick those things out of the air. These are issues that I have counseled people over the last year, year and a half with. So I'm talking about real life issues that are not exempt from people in the church. I'm talking about born again believers talking about Christians who are dealing with these issues of hurt in their life. And we have a choice. What are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Later on in this series, I'm going to talk about our response to some of these things. And sometimes I think we get too, I use this term, pharmaceutical that Pharisee spirit that says something like, I taught them better. I raised them in church. And I can't believe now that they're doing this. Therefore, I've cut them off. Tough love. Well, let me ask you something. How would you like for God to cut you off? Because we've not always lived up to his standards. Hello? I don't care how high your halo fits. We've not all lived up to his standards. And what if God would have stepped back and said, well, you know what? You didn't live up to my standard. So I'm just going to shut you out of my life. Or how about we do what God does and extend the ministry of reconciliation and extend a hand of mercy instead of a hand of judgment, that we show them his agape love, right? When You know, when you say you love somebody, let me just say this. When you say you love somebody, what you're asking God to do is for God to help you see them through his eyes. God, help me see them through your eyes. And I'm not up here condoning sin. Don't get me wrong. But I am up here trying to teach us on how to reconcile people back to God. And I can tell you right now, judging them is not going to reconcile them back to God. Loving them, forgiving them is going to reconcile them back to God. How many of you believe that this this morning? Let me give you a couple of things here, a couple of keys to help us on this journey of love. The first key is this, choose to love over the hurt. Choose love over the hurt. I know you're hurt. I know you raised them in in the faith. I know trust has been broken. But how many of you know that your Bible is full of examples of those who chose love over hurt. I'll just give you one example. There are multiple examples. The story of Joseph. Joseph, his brothers hated him. The Bible says they had not one kind word to say about their brother Joseph. The Bible lets us know that they were jealous of him because of the favor that the father placed upon his life. They despised him. And they had a plan to kill him. And if it wasn't for his brother Judah, who talked the rest of them into selling him as a slave, they would have killed him. Listen to me. I'm not talking about strangers. I'm talking about his brothers. His brothers plotted and planned to kill him. And we know that he was sold to an Egyptian official. His name was Potiphar. His wife falsely accused him of rape. He's thrown into prison. 
He interprets later on dreams of the butler and the baker. And then another uh, several years go by, Pharaoh has a dream. And he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And he's brought into second in charge and power of all of Egypt. And it was during these seven years of famine that he predicted would come that his brothers came to him. And when his brothers came to him for food, for survival, they did not recognize that it was Joseph, but he recognized them. Now Joseph has a choice. He has the nitro in his hands. He could use it to blow this thing up, or he could use it to bring healing in his life and in their life. It's been said that the depth of your hurt determines the width of your response. Because when you've been hurt, especially by those whom you love and are close to, your instinct is likely to want to hurt back, to retaliate. Have you ever been in a situation where you held the upper hand? Where you held the power to get even? You had the ability to get even with somebody? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. But I want you to put yourself in Joseph's place. He's in a position of power and of influence, and he could have sought revenge and totally wiped his brothers out. However, the Bible lets us know through a series of twists and turns, he reveals himself to his brothers. And in one of the most moving moments in your Bible, he chooses to forgive them. And this is what he said. Look at this verse in Genesis chapter 50. This is what he said. You intended it to harm me, but God intended it for good. To accomplish what is now being done. Saving, saving of many or the saving of many lives. When you trust God, and in his time and in his way, God can redeem the situation. And God will use it as part of your story that's connected to your destiny. Don't blow it up. Don't blow it up. Trust God, because not only did Joseph heal himself at this moment, he healed his brothers as well, and he saved his entire family. You don't know whether or not your response, think about this, you don't know whether or not God will use your response to touch that person who has offended you and hurt you, to break their heart so that they cry out to an awesome God. When the brothers received Joseph's forgiveness, they understood and recognized the God in whom he served. Why? Because we're supposed to be different than the world. We're supposed to respond and react different than the world. I want you to watch this video and I'll be right back. I want to thank each one of you for being here today from those in the very back here in the tent to the very front row. We are blessed and honored that you are here. Thank you. And I have learned this week as never before that everybody has a Billy Graham story. And even this week, President Trump told us about his Billy Graham story. As a little boy, his father took him to Yankee Stadium to hear my father preach. And he said, this is a big deal. <laughs> little did they know that their paths would cross many, many years later. But I have my own Billy Graham story, so I'm gonna tell you that one. And I've told it many times, and some of you have maybe heard it many times, but it bears repeating because to me, it speaks to the essence of who my father was and is. After 21 years, my marriage ended in divorce. I was devastated. I floundered. I did a lot wrong. The rug was pulled out from under me. My family thought it'd be a good idea for me to move away, to get a fresh start somewhere else. So I decided to live near my older sister and her family and near a good church. The pastor of that church introduced me to a handsome widower 
and we began to date fast and furiously. My children didn't like him, but I thought, you know, they were almost grown. They didn't know what they could, they couldn't tell me what to do. I knew what was best for my life. My mother called me from Seattle. My father called me from Tokyo. They said, honey, why don't you slow down? Let us wait to get to know this man. They had never been a single parent. They had never been divorced. What did they know? So being stubborn, willful, and sinful, I married a man, this man, on New Year's Eve. And within 24 hours, I knew I'd made a terrible mistake. After five weeks, I fled. I was afraid of him. What was I going to do? I wanted to go talk to my mother and my father. It was a two-day drive. Questions swirled in my mind. What was I going to say to Daddy? What was I going to say to Mother? What was I going to say to my children? I'd been such a failure. What were they going to say to me? You, we, we're tired of fooling with you. We told you not to do it. You've embarrassed us. And let me tell you, you women will understand you don't want to embarrass your father. You really don't want to embarrass Billy Graham. And many of you know that we live on the side of a mountain. And as I wound myself up the mountain, I rounded the last bend in my father's driveway, and my father was standing there waiting for me. As I got out of the car, he wrapped his arms around me and he said, welcome home. There was no shame, there was no blame, there was no condemnation, just unconditional love. And you know, my father was not God, but he showed me what God was like that day. When we come to God with our sin, our brokenness, our failure, our pain and our hurt, God says, welcome home. And that invitation is open for you. Thank you and God bless you. You're never more like God than when you're offering forgiveness. You know, Dr. Graham could have said, I told you not to do that. He could have said, I knew this was going to happen. He could have said, you made your bed, now lie in it. He could have said, I was right and you're wrong. But at that moment, he chose to heal. Life is too short for grudges. Life is too short to try to punish somebody for an act that they've committed. You'll never, ever get ahead trying to get even. Doesn't work that way. And I know there's some people under the sound of my voice. I, I couldn't even begin to imagine some of the things that you've had to go through. I'm not so naive to not think that there are people that have not been abused that are hearing me right now in some form or some fashion. And I'm not by no means saying that you need to let that person back into your life and give them access to things in your life. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this, you need to separate the person from the act. from their actions. And if, there are, if, if you need to have boundaries, then have boundaries. But choose, choose to forgive. 
Because when you forgive, it releases you. And it brings healing into your life. And God, let God take care of that other stuff. But you be about the ministry of reconciliation. Offering forgiveness the same way that God offered it to us unconditionally. I want you to stand with me. Nobody leaving, nobody moving around right now. Just give us this moment. There's a, there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about comfort. And it says this. It says that you then are able to comfort those who need comforting. So in other words, things that you go through, God says, I'll use you to bring comfort to somebody who's going through it somewhere down the line. I'll say it another way, the pain you feel today is the pain that you can heal tomorrow. So whatever hurt, pain that you've experienced, God says, I'll use that to bring about healing in somebody else's life. where you can walk up to somebody and say, I know exactly how you feel. I know exactly what you're going through. I know exactly the emotions that you feel when this or that happens. I've been there. I've experienced that. But let me tell you, I've also experienced God's amazing grace. God's forgiveness. God's healing in my life. And if God did that for me, I know he'll do it for you. Because he's no respecter of persons. He doesn't love me any more than he loves you. Agape. Unconditional. I know this series is going to get tight in some spots because it's going to be raw. Our hearts are going to be ripped open. God's going to be performing spiritual surgery on us. It's only because he wants us to be whole and healed. And I feel in my heart right now that there are some people that are wounded you're hurt. You're really hurt. This, it's, it's kind of like that bruise and I'm just touching it right now. I'm touching it. I'm touching it. I'm not doing it. The Holy Spirit is. You're hurting. I just, would you take that first step of healing by forgiving I know it's tough. I know it's hard. But it starts right there in your own heart. And I'm going to ask you to do something that may be even difficult for you to do. I'm going to ask you to just get out of your seat and join us in this altar for prayer. So I just want you to know we're here to support you. And we're here to help you. But you have to get honest. and You have to be open before God can move in that situation. So with every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around, Pastor, that's me. I'm hurting right now. I'm hurting. And I don't feel like forgiving. But it's not about how you feel. 
It's about just making this choice in this first step of forgiveness. If that's you, just lift up your hand right where you're at. Just lift it up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. They're going up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. And put them back down. Maybe you've never come to an altar, but an altar is a place where you come and offer that up to God. That's what an altar is. If you lifted your hand, would you, I'm going to give you another opportunity. Would you just join us at this altar right now? I'm just going to pray a few minutes. Come on. Thank you. Anyone else? Come on. That's right. Come on. We need some more people to help us pray. Come on. Come on. To my left, Tom. Pastor, I'm hurt. I'm wounded. I want to share something God showed me back during the worship. I just felt God's presence so strongly. And I wasn't here the first service. I hadn't heard the message. I thought this little vision was for me, but it's for everybody. I saw a heart that was just filled with numerous, numerous cracks, all the hurts. And then I saw the heart beating and with the light of God and being healed and strong again. And so this is what God totally wants to do for us today. And I just praise him and thank him for his Holy Spirit. Thank you, Eve. I think what God showed is if your heart's been shattered in a million pieces, he wants to put it back together. I'm going to pray. They're already praying, but is anybody else? Just join us. Join us. Those of you that are watching us online, I just pray that God would touch your heart right now. His healing power would begin to flow throughout your life right now. Those of you that are here today, I just pray that God would touch your heart right now. He would begin to put the pieces back together. The Bible says he heals the brokenhearted, puts it back together together. Let's worship. And as we worship, I believe God's bringing healing into your life right now. Come on, let's worship together. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet night won't last your 
word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. Still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never still stands great is your faithfulness your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail me yet never fail me yet Confidence, you never fail me yet. 